Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Fuse Accessories, Muddy Outdoors, Cabela's, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Frigid Forage, Rocket Broadheads, Easton Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, Ozonics, Wilderness Athlete, and Nikon. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. Today I'm going to take you on part two of the Midwest Whitetail walkabout. We're going to spend some time on this little food plot. I'm going to talk about the, the, uh, what we plant here and why, and then about the site selection itself. Why did I pick this spot? Because it's time right now for us to start thinking about getting these little small food plots in the ground and getting them established. Uh, month of April is really sort of the, the number one month, I think, for creating these small food plots. So let's take a look at this one. And uh, we've got some more stuff for you in today's episode too, but I'm gonna start right here. This plot is about an acre in size. And it was more or less of a natural opening in the woods here. There's a few of them on the farm where, uh, for whatever reason, maybe it was an old home site or you know, one reason or another, the timber really just didn't grow that well in these spots. So it didn't take a whole lot to clean it up. Chainsaw, knock off a few small trees. For example, I mean, you can see I don't know, four or five trees right here. We left those in, this food plot wraps around them, this little, little aisle in the trees there. But that'd be the type of stuff that you might have to take out. You know, a few of them here, and a few of them there, and then you've got a really nice food plot. So that's what I did in this, in this spot. And I like ridge tops is my number one choice because the wind is more consistent in these spots. Anytime you get down over the hill, and especially when you get down into the bottoms, you get a lot more swirling winds. So you know, when it comes to this feeding deer, you know, granted you can put a food plot anywhere to just feed deer, but if you want to hunt that spot effectively, it needs to be someplace where you've got a wind advantage. So these ridges are the key there. Uh, this one, like I said, was an opening that was already here, more or less, but I picked it because of its proximity to the gravel road. I can park about a quarter of a mile up the road and walk down the road until I'm even with the tree stand and then just cut right through the timber right directly to the tree stand. And I'll take you to that tree stand, it's on the other side of the food plot. All I would do then is just bring a clipper with me the first time in. It would be an afternoon hunt for the first hunt. I'd clip all the vines and brush and you know the, the multiflower rows and, and those sorts of things out of the trail so I can go in and out real quickly and real quietly and then that establishes my entry and exit route and because it's so close to the gravel road it's pretty unlikely the deer are going to come from that direction so I set up where the wind is blowing out of the timber on this side where most of the deer are going to be living blowing towards that road so not only does it keep my scent away from most of the deer while I'm in the tree stand uh, and I can't remember ever being winded maybe once or twice in the many years that I've hunted this spot uh, while I was in the tree. So that works really well, but it also allows you to walk into the stand with the wind in your face. So those are the number one uh, priorities for my food plot choice is, is going to be on a ridge, someplace close to a convenient entry and exit route where I can enter with the wind in my face and the stand location is going to be ideally one where the, the wind is blowing towards someplace where the deer are unlikely to be. That's my perfect stand location, my perfect setup, and this little food plot uh, pretty much is an example of all of those things. Let me walk you down to the tree stand now. The tree stand is over my right shoulder up in that uh, shingle oak tree. And I'm sure that if you've watched Midwest Whitetail for very long, you've seen a lot of hunts that took place on this food plot. And I've probably talked about this tree stand before as well. But I just thought it was worth sort of, you know, bringing the tree stand into this. That's not the number one thing that I wanted to focus on with the site selection, but as long as we're here, we might as well talk about it. It's convenient because the deer enter the food plot from the other side and they work their way down this little narrow corridor past that stand. And that's why it sets up so well where it's at. Any deer that are out in this food plot, if they're far enough away from that stand, I can actually climb down out of it, stay on the back side of the tree, drop off into the brush, and then slip down to the road without the deer in the food plot even knowing that I'm, that I'm hunting them. So that's, it's nice to have some type of an exit strategy. 
uh, at the end of legal shooting time. With these really small food plots like this, you don't run into near as much of a problem at the end of legal shooting time as you do in the big fields where you might have four or five or six or who knows how many deer that are going to be there for several hours. Usually they'll feed in these little small plots for a little while then they'll move on to someplace else. Rarely in the evening do you have a deer that's just glued in here. Uh, so that's one of the upsides of hunting these small plots is the deer come in, they feed for a little while, then they move off and you have the perfect time for, you, for sneaking down and getting out. I planted clover, the Frigid Forage Pure Trophy Clover in this food plot and I like clover in these small plots because it can take a fair amount of deer pressure. It, it's not one of those deals like where if you plant beans in here the deer can wipe it out during the summer. Uh, any type of a grain crop the deer have a good chance of wiping it out during the summer and you end up with nothing here in the fall. Clover does really well all summer long, feeds the deer, and then there's always clover left. You know, clear on into the end of November, sometimes clear into December if it stays warm enough where you don't get a lot of really hard killing frosts that'll knock that clover down. I mean, I've hunted over clover clear into December before. So it's perfect for these little small food plots like this. These spots become the social hub during the rut. Every buck that walks past this area has to pop in here and see what's going on at this little food plot. They go around the edge, they'll make a few scrapes, uh, they sniff around, then they go you know, onto the next bedding area. But these are the best hunting spots on, on my whole farm. So if, you, if you're thinking of, of a spring project to make your fall hunting better, uh, coming up with a small food plot like this, fairly close to a bedding area where you've got the perfect access and wind advantage, uh, that's going to be the key to really improving your odds this fall. All right, that's a wrap up on this spot, but our episode is going to continue with Chef Aaron Neal. And if you remember back in November of last year, Aaron Warbritton from the office killed an old buck on public land. The deer was all rutted up. You know, he had to be, I don't know how many years old he was. He was a fully mature deer. This is the type of buck that generally, you know, people are thinking about donating to the Hunters for the Hungry program, to be honest with you. But this is one that they decided that they were going to show us uh, a recipe for making potentially gamey venison taste really good. So we're going to join Chef Aaron Neal now, and he's going to take us through his secret recipe. Hi, I'm Chef Aaron Neal. They say you can't eat an old buck. Well, I got a five-year-old buck loin here that my good friend Aaron Warbritton shot with his bow this last fall. Now I'm going to prove to you that you can. We're going to do a Dijon breadcrumb encrusted brandy cream and mushroom sauce venison loin. Now don't let that intimidate you. It's really not that difficult even though it sounds like it. For this dish we're going to need Dijon mustard, panko breadcrumbs, olive oil, some parsley for garnish, brandy, mushrooms, cream, garlic. We're going to use some asparagus just to plate it with. We're going to start off with our little salt and pepper mix. Pretty generous. We're going to go into our Dijon mustard. Getting this uh, mustard on here not only for flavor but it's going to help keep your breadcrumbs on. Once we get the breadcrumbs on it, we're going to Take it over to our pan and sear it until we get that GBD, that golden brown and delicious, baby. Now the breadcrumbs, you want to be pretty liberal, make sure they don't fall off. You're going to sear this on all four sides, so you want to get breadcrumbs coated on it, all the edges. See how that mustard helps keep it on there? Hopefully they'll stick in the pan as well. Now that we got that on, we're going to go over here and heat up our pans. We're going to go to about a medium high heat. You're going to grab your olive oil. Put just enough in there to coat the pan. You always want to cook with a hot pan. We're almost to the smoking point. We're going to go ahead and drop it in. Fit. Now whether you're using a non-stick or just a regular cast iron skillet, you don't want to mess with it until it gets good and seared because it'll stick, especially in these cast iron skillets. So I'm just going to let it cook for a while until I think it 
done, I'll check it just by raising it up just a little bit. And if it's sticking, I'll just leave it alone. Come back to it. Well, I got a couple of the breadcrumbs to stick, not all of them. Can't be perfect all the time. Trust me. <laughs> After we let this sear, about four minutes on each side, it's still pretty rare. You can tell it's flamboyant. We're going to go ahead and put it on a pan. And we had our oven on 400, so we're going to go ahead and throw it in here for five, six minutes. Check it. If it ain't done, we'll just put it back in. I like mine medium rare, so I'm going to check it every five minutes or so until it gets there. It's pretty rare right now, but once it gets right around 140 degrees, 145, I'm going to pull it and let it rest. Now we're going to make our mushroom brandy cream sauce. I'm going to start off with a little brandy. Now this stuff will flare up on you if you ain't careful. So let your pan cool down just a little bit. Put all forever how much sauce you need. I only need about cup or so, I'm going to put six or seven tablespoons in there. Come over here and we're going to reduce this by half. Chopping mushrooms. Got the brandy reducing. These you can do whatever you want to with them. You can slice them, dice them, chop them. I'm just going to make some little chunks. Grab your mushrooms. By now, your brandy should be down to about half. Let's go check it out. Brandy's reduced by half. We're going to throw these in. Let them sizzle there. Grab our salt, pepper mix. Season our mushrooms. Gonna grab our garlic. That minced garlic. Gonna throw that in. Really smell all those earthy flavors. Next step, cream. This is a really good way to do venison on a cold winter day like today. It's got a lot of earthly warm flavors to it. It's really gonna set things off in the kitchen. I'm gonna go ahead and check the temperature. She's still pretty loose. I'm gonna put her back in for a while. Boy, she smells good. We got our loin resting, so we're gonna go ahead and finish her sauce with a dollop of butter. See how it's starting to thicken up, produced. It's gonna be good. Ooh. We're gonna go ahead and plate it. We're gonna do a little bed of asparagus. Put them in there. We're gonna slice our venison. You always want to slice against the grain. I can see the grain kind of running like this. So I'm going to start off over here. Just get nice little medallions. Take them. Nice medium rare. Now we're going to top it off with our sauce. Garnish a little bit, parsley. Doesn't look too bad, does it? Let's see how it tastes. Come here and sink your tooth into it, Benny. Looks pretty delicious. Try it. I ought to try it first, but I got confidence. <laughs> Dijon breadcrumb encrusted venison with a brandy mushroom cream sauce. Till next time, I'm Chef Aaron Neal. Good luck and good hunting.
every time I watch one of Chef Aaron Neal's segments, it makes me want to get some meat out of the freezer and get busy in the kitchen. I really appreciate his contributions. It helps us out during the off season to keep our minds on what we do this for, and that's to come up with something really good to eat on the table. Well, that's it for this week. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big. <laughs>